Welcome everyone. We anticipated a fair amount of excitement around the exhibition, John Singer Sargent Watercolors, and we're not being disappointed if tonight is any indication, so we're thrilled you're all here with us. Um, by way of further introduction of Richard, I just want to say that artistic reputations are based essentially on the quality and greatness of the art, but their continuation is based on a nurturing process that can span decades and even centuries. And no one has contributed more to the sustenance of Sargent's reputation than Richard in years of amazing research and documentation. And what you see on the screen right now are images of the first seven volumes of the catalog Raisonne, seven. And they are not little books. They are not um, primarily picture books. They are amazing reference books about an amazing career. And Richard is joined in his work by a team of people who are here tonight, the Sargent Catalog people. You want to just raise your hand? Uh, Elizabeth Ustinoff, Elaine Kilmurray, and Warren Adelson. And before we start, I also want to ask my co-curator, Erica, to stand for a second and say hello to everyone. I think that part of what generates the enthusiasm we're experiencing tonight is a tremendous pride of ownership of this part of the Brooklyn Museum collection, which has been here since 1909. And since that time, it has been considered one of the great treasures and gems of our entire holdings. And it's absolutely remarkable to see everything out and together and merged with the contents of the second early purchase of watercolors in 1912 by the MFA Boston. Um, I hope you visit the exhibition tonight and repeatedly and read the catalog. But tonight we're going to chat with Richard to gain more of a sense of Sargent the Man that he has really uncovered as part of his remarkable research and owing in part as well to his personal connections and we're going to talk about three general subjects, the first being um, Sargent's family <clears throat> and their role in his art making. Also Sargent's amazing entourage of friends who also were very much a part, particularly of the watercolors. And then finally, some of Sargent's travels and the places he painted because Richard has I think virtually traced all of those pathways at this point. So welcome. Thank you. And we're going to start by considering um, Sargent's studio in London and the fact that at the time of his death in 1925, there were hundreds and hundreds of watercolors there. <laughs> there were. Um, and one should just say this is 31 Tite Street. Uh, which is still there, has been lovingly restored by its uh, new owners and um, has regained uh, its character once more. Uh, he also had a studio of 33 Tide Street. Um, and uh, you can see here some of the props and some of the furniture which appears in his portraits um, and uh, his piano, he was a great musician, um, and there's the sitter's stand top right um, with the, uh, and in fact you can't really see it, but there's a, a piece of a boiserie French 18th century panelling which he used to deploy in his portraits. Uh, and the um, gramophone, he was, used to regale his sitters, often with Spanish music. Um, uh, and you can see here he's got on bottom left, he's preparing to do a charcoal portrait. Um, and in the middle is the stereoscopic uh, viewer for photographs. And I think we're going to see a photograph or two. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was very interested in the medium of photography and took these stereoscopic, which when you look at through the, the bioscope, gives you a 3D effect. Um, and the furniture, too, uh, all rather French um, and uh, sort of empire, Louis says, 
very much the kind of things that all his clients were going in for, the fashionable uh, French um, Rococo 18th century style, and that was very much his kind of um, st the style he admired uh, very much. Um, so, uh, 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 and of course, um, uh, a lot of these props appear in, in the portraits. And in one of the volumes, we, we detail all the, uh, the different accessories that he used. And it was full of watercolors in great portfolios because originally he wouldn't sell anything. Um, uh, rather to the dismay of friends and collectors who said, well, can we buy these? And Mr. Sargent used to say, no, uh, I really do these for m myself. And he, he said on one occasion, when I'm painting somebody like Lord Londonderry, a great grandee, I need to remind myself that, you know, I'm not a complete duffer. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so these watercolors were very important to him. And it was really only, uh, there were three big one-man shows in London, 1903, 1905, 1908. Nothing was for sale. And it was only when he sent them over to Brooklyn. He was very reluctant to bring them over. He thought it was too much hassle. You know, they weren't... Uh, and he said at the time, I won't sell to individual collectors, but if an institution were to be interested, then, then I would do it. And that's... Uh, and Brooklyn came forward, and, um, uh, and then Boston was terribly miffed that they'd been beaten to the post. <laughs> And they, they put a sort of lean on him and said, well, next time, Mr. Sargent, you jolly well going to, um, uh, you're going to uh, let us have first crack of the whip. And so he was conscious, I think, when he was doing the Boston lot, that these were going to an institution, which is why, they're, in general, they're on a larger, slightly larger scale. They're a bit more finished, a um, bit more like presentation watercolors, whereas the Brooklyn were a, a sort of gathering of the over a longer course of time. Um, but uh, the house was, uh, and the same with oil paintings. And uh, in spite of these two big sales, he did let, he gave things away, particularly his wedding presents and to friends, fellow artists. So he gave a lot away. But at the end, um, you know, his two sisters who inherited all these things, um, they had a big sergeant sale in 1925, and about 100 of the watercolors were put in. My grandfather wanted to persuade the sisters to put in everything, because he realized that, you know, Sergeant Price's, this was the moment to go. And this sale, which included oil paintings, made about uh, nearly half a million dollars in r real terms, which goodness knows what that is in today's terms. So it was the moment to strike. But even with that, they were still left with an enormous number of things. And they gave away in the 1930s to the MFA in Boston and to the Fog hundreds of um, sheets of drawings and watercolors. And they gave an even bigger, my grandmother in 1950, Frances Taylor, the then director of the Met, sort of squirreled out of her, you know, another few hundred um, uh, <laughs> drawings and watercolors. And I don't think anybody's fully, and they gave to left, right, and center to smaller institutions. Anybody has realized the scale of these gifts um, from the two sisters. Mm -hmm. And even so, quite a lot came down through the family. And I remember going to my grandmother's flat in Chelsea, um, uh, which was just covered from floor to ceiling with um, Sergeant. Were they framed on the Oh, walls? they were all framed, yes. They got framed. Sergeant never bothered to frame them because they, in, and actually, one of the things was he said, well, I, I, you know, I've got to frame these, and that's mm -hmm. a tremendous bore, and I've got to go to the consul to get the papers, I've got to go to this people, it's all too much hassle. And you realize that he was having to do all this himself. Yes. He didn't um, have a staff. What? He didn't have a staff. He no staff, and he, all his, his scrawling, he's very difficult letter writer, I mean, he scrawls letters, I mean, he's doing, and also he's very unbusinesslike often. He has rights to people to say, um, I'm not quite sure if I've had your check or not. Could you, <laughs> could you please let me know? Um, so, uh, Richard, you mentioned portfolios of yeah. watercolors. Were they grouped in any specific way or were I they random? I don't think so, no. Yeah. I mean, um, I think when he chose the, you know, he had an idea of what was his really, and when he did them for the Carfax gallery, I think those were 
the things he really uh, and, uh, cared about. And he did exhibit every year at the Royal mm -hmm. Watercolour Society, mm -hmm. where, of course, his, his work sort of blew everything else off the walls, you know, because um, they weren't kind of traditional English watercolours, you know, these big, bold, splashy watercolours, you know, yes. were... Um, but uh, I don't think he had... I don't know that. It's interesting whether mm -hmm. he had any... I mean, he certainly, of course, he's a sequential painter, you know, he, a serial painter, like uh, Monet with the water lilies or mm -hmm. Cezanne. I mean, he's a serial painter. Variations painting, on a and theme. A w yeah. uh, and he certainly, when he talked to, to the about the Brooklyn, uh, to Nerdler, because he said, oh, well, Mr. Dear Mr. Boyd, because it was a joint exhibition, you, you do it all, don't, you know, <laughs> you hang it just, because he didn't come over, you hang it as you want. And then he said, oh, by the way, um, I think the Bedouin things would be rather nice. And um, you might think of starting with Venice or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, uh, he was kind of calling the shots from, mm -hmm. a, from a distance. So let's talk a little bit about some of the very, very important family members, and perhaps most important is Sergeant Sister Emily. Oh, yes. Um, we have two photos here, one of Emily with her friend Eliza Wedgwood in a gondola in Venice, yes. and on the right, Emily watching Sergeant painting, hovering, one might say. Yes. <laughs> you could never miss um, Aunt Emily because she's always there in black. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, they were brought up together in, uh, I mean, it's a very um, odd upbringing. Um, uh, uh, they were both born in Europe and brought up in that kind of migrant existence, moving with the seasons from the south, and then uh, as the weather improved, you came north. And so, and you met a few other expatriates doing the same uh, sort of routine, uh, but they were very much thrown together on their own resources, and they were only a year apart. Uh, and I think always Sargent had a very warm feeling and protective feeling to his sister. She had a sort of dis disablement, her back was not straight. And I think her mother had seized on Emily as the daughter who was gonna look after her. And so in a certain sense, as so many of daughters were sacrificial mm -hmm. um, victims. But Caretakers, um, yeah. Sar mm -hmm. Sargent always, I think, and she absolutely doted on him. And she was a very, uh, I mean, she could have been, she was very musical like him. There was a thought that she might go and study music in Dresden, and, but I'm afraid the mum put a stop to that. Um, and so um, you feel she never, but she was a very talented um, a watercolorist in her own right. And there are several hundred sheets, and she really deserves to, um, there she is uh, with the two nieces. Um, uh, you can't miss her, yes. Uh, uh, with the brush in her mouth. With the br br brush. So she was, uh, but she never exhibited, but, but uh, she was prolific. Um, and uh, They often painted side by side, correct? What? They painted side by side on yes, many occasions. Yes, very often. And she was invariably the person who went with him on his, uh, on his uh, sketching expedition. She was uh, a familiar... Uh, uh, figure um, and uh, uh, it's a very uh, somebody de described her as the wife he never had really because it, uh, you know she was and in Chelsea she lived just round the corner from him and he used to go round every day and she would entertain for him you know all the friends and everything else so it was a very touching um, relationship really and was she prolific as well in terms of the number of watercolors she executed? Yes, and there are some that, um, uh, which um, uh, have on the back, um, with Sargent's help, where he would add afterwards, it kind of pep them up, you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, but, uh, <laughs> and she, she never complained. She always had a, she always looked on the bright side of things. She had a great, she was highly intelligent, very sharp, uh, didn't suffer fools gladly. She had a real gift for friendship. And she really, in spite of, the, you might think, you know, being limited and living with mother and all that, you, uh, but she never, she made the most of life. Um, as intrepid as he was. 
She was as intrepid as he was. Yes, yes. she was yeah. in her own way. Yeah. Yes, um, she was a remarkable character. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, I didn't never knew her because in the, my grandmother was 14 years younger and my father was her, the youngest child, so it's really like a double. And she was knocked over by a bicycle in Zurich and died in consequence, 1936, so te about 10 years after him. Right. And there you see him, as somebody said, l l looking like as he, a chicken just emerging from an egg with, <laughs> with, 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 with all his painting umbrellas. Large and stout, and there he is in the act of uh, out in the mountains. Sargent also had this entourage of friends who he, were with him. Yeah, he liked to be surrounded by, yes. by um, uh, his, particularly in the Alps, his family, you know, the nephews and nieces and his sisters and other friends. And then when he went, the pattern was to start in the Alps in August. Then he would go to Venice um, and meet up with fellow artists. And then they would either decide to go to Mallorca, Corfu, uh, southern Spain, uh, Rome, Frascati, whatever it might be. And so there were two or three months each year um, he was taking out to... Uh, from portrait painting and mural painting. Um, and uh, there you see a group at the Saint-Plan. Um, uh, and the, the uh, figure yeah. I want to point out is Peter uh, well, Harrison. Top, yeah, the uh, one seated is Peter Harrison, who's the one lounging in the bed here. I love this picture. He's much too tall for the bed. Uh, and he's smoking a pipe. And I love this sort of I intimate view of his, and there's several um, yes. of this sort yeah. of, uh, of this, uh, of his friends in bed in these, uh, in the, with all that great um, bolsters you get in, in, uh, in Swiss hotels. And when uh, we were thinking and about... Are, yes, and there in the middle, the, the, the sergeant is on the wall behind with his <laughs> hand like that, and then in front of him is Ambrogio Raffaele, yes. who's a, a, an Italian painter he met in Portu, came from Vigivano, town in northern Italy, and that I've just come across, or been by a, 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 somebody writing a book, a whole lot of letters from Raffaele to another friend describing his experiences in, um, in, uh, with Sargent, whom he deeply admired um, in the Samplon in Portu, and he and two other Italians, they, they spent several seasons in the Val d'Aosta, and then they followed Sargent up to the Samplon, so they were sort of um, perennial friends. What was interesting when we were thinking about some of these reclining figures was looking for other bed imagery from this looking for bed imagery. Oh, bed other imagery, And it's yes. actually quite rare. Yeah. Uh, well, and there's that fantastic oil painting here yes. in his studio, which mm -hmm. is Raffaele, who's actually not painting on plein air. Yeah. I mean, usually Sargent is, paints his fellow artists in the act of painting landscape, and you mm -hmm. feel it's often a kind of autobiography because it's, you know, it's Sargent r r painting somebody else painting. Um, uh, but um, that's an incredible picture because he's squashed in mm -hmm. with this huge great picture in this mm -hmm. very small bedroom. Mm -hmm. And then there's this huge great bed and it's sumptuously The sheets painted, are the most beautiful part of the picture. Sumptuously painted, yeah. and it's sort of, you know, the inner, in a world of the artist mm -hmm. and the, the private man. You know, you can imagine the, every, the picture being put away and Raphael getting into his nightshirt, which is thrown over the end mm -hmm. of the bed and climbing into that huge great bed, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I think one of the most remarkable things is how many seasons all these people spent together, year yeah. after year, that it was something they clearly all loved. And they loved being part of the the yeah. process and yeah. Sargent's work and the experience. And um, they were real painting expeditions. He, he didn't go on holiday and just happened to sketch. Right. He went on holiday, or he didn't, he went to other countries to paint. They were painting campaigns. Um, but he also loved playing music because he was so intensely musical. And he was very, very widely read. And I've just recently, catalogued um, his French library, um, which was several hundred volumes. He very, very, and French literature, he really preferred to English literature, uh, Voltaire, and then the contemporary people like uh, Baudelaire and, and um, uh, Flaubert and Verlaine. So he's, 
uh, and then they would have a, a play chess and read, and, uh, but daytime, he's out on the, mm -hmm. you know, wherever it is. Uh, 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 yeah. <coughs> there he is at uh, Port U. Yes, quite interesting. I w when I went there, I couldn't find the brook. You because the, the, brook. the brook is features in numerous pictures, uh, both with the with figures and also just the brook. And actually, the, it's one of the few. I mean, most of the things that Sargent painted is still there because he painted, tended to paint old buildings and mountains don't change and so much. But this, they but they uh, they finally said, oh yes, yes, we diverted that a few years <laughs> back. So uh, uh, you did your best yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, now. He's featuring, um, in this photo, Rosemary yes. Ormond. Yes. And she is wearing one of the Eastern costumes That's that he right. purchased when he did his tour of the Levant. Well, she's, um, uh, uh, she was uh, very beautiful. Um, the two girls were both Wren and Rosemary, but um, uh, she was, an, uh, she was a, um, um, obviously a wonderful personality. Um, and... Um, very selfless, rather like her, her aunt, uh, Emily, um, thinking always more of other people than herself. And she's really one of the presiding geniuses of the exhibition or the model because she appears numerous times mm -hmm. and she was really his favorite Alpine model. And um, it, she's a very tragic story because um, she was brought up by her French grandmother and um, married a Frenchman, a brilliant um, medieval art historian uh, called Robert André Michel. And he was killed, they were married for less, barely a year when he was killed on the Western Front. And she then, uh, and I've got her letters to her brother, the agony of his loss, um, and her attempts to be brave and all of that. And then she tended the blind, blind soldiers at Roy in a, a suburb of Paris. In a, uh, and then in 1918, she was in Saint-Gervais for, for a service, and the, one of the German shells struck it, and uh, about 80 people were killed, including Rosemary. And they're buried in a lovely tomb um, uh, near where Robert fell, um, uh, outside Soissons. It's a very moving monument, and it's, and it's very well looked after by the, uh, the local commune. But this, I always think, this sort of brilliant couple, you know, is one of the, the things. Mm -hmm. So, um, but she is uh, absolutely, and you, she, she, her sparkling personality comes across absolutely. in all those lovely, sumptuous uh, pictures of her, either in Oriental costume or in those great big summer um, uh, things. And she, you can feel her personality, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that incredible one where he's wound the cashmere shawl around her like yes. a mummy, yeah. you know. Uh, I mean, no, the shawls, you could do a whole thing, couldn't you, on shawls and Absolutely. costumes. It's here. I mean, an entire And the sergeant, is, yeah. he's arbitrarily playing with it. I mean, he's creating these uh, costumes, uh, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And this is um, a larger group of the Ormond children. Oh, yes, yeah, that's all six of them, the six nephews and nieces. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Wren is on the left and um she's younger than rosemary yeah, yes, yes. Uh, she's younger ren uh, and um my cousin rose who's uh, ren's daughter is in the audience tonight so um with her husband larry um so uh, <laughs> and her son ian and holly uh, my father is the little boy in the foreground the two boys jean louis who uh, ran the Swiss tobacco, Monsieur, or the, they ran the tobacco uh, company, uh, and Guillaume, who became organist at Truro Cathedral in England, very musical. Uh, Paul Marguerite, who was really uh, rested development and mm -hmm. was institutionalized, and then Rosemarie on the right. And here they are in, this is the Barnard, Dorothy Barnard, you probably, some of you know Carnation, Lily, Lily Rose. Well, Dorothy was one of the little girls there, and here she is, uh, and this is the watercolor called, um, is it Reading? Yeah, Reading, um, with Rose Marie, sort of line, line and um, uh, uh, Dorothy Barnard. And Dorothy Barnard, I knew she was my brother's godmother as a very old woman, still living in Broadway, where Carnation, Lily, Lily Rose was 
painted, mm -hmm. this elderly lady um, was still a sort of link right back to Carnation, Lily Lily Rose. But it gives you a sense of how over decades these people continued to figure so yes. pivotally yes. in his and, work. Yes, and um, Mr. Yes. Barnard, Frederick Barnard, mm -hmm. was an illustrator famous for his Dickens illustrations, but he took to the bottle. And Sargent sort of really kept, I think, felt a responsibility to Mrs. Barnard, to Dorothy, Alice yeah. Barnard. Mm -hmm. And they were always, and a lot of these people were also part of his Chelsea set. You know, they all lived in Chelsea. And so, as it were, they then moved out into the Alps, you know, as a sort of entourage. En masse, right. yeah. And something that uh, we, we had a tour through the exhibition earlier today, and someone asked about the patience of these friends and family who were models, and Erica responded saying that, well, at least they were allowed to lie down and read books. <laughs> so. I think, I think at, a, at breakfast you tried to avoid eye contact because <laughs> otherwise you were in for a whole day of work sitting. <laughs> yeah, but it was worth it. What? It yes. was worth it. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned Raffaelli. Um, on the left is a photograph of Sargent and Raffaele uh, cleaning up a picnic in the Alps. And on the right, one of the great watercolors in Brooklyn's collections called In a Hayloft, uh, in which Sargent has painted his two, two of his Italian plein air painter friends, Raffaele and uh, Polinera. And I just think it's an exquisite picture. And it shows how close they were in their art and yes. the days and days they spent together, um, yes. both working outside in oil, in watercolor, um, really relishing the setting and working in natural light. It was what they sought. Yes, I think it was a very um, close sort of, uh, 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 and, and I think he, uh, you know, the bearded figure, like a sort mm -hmm. of venerable sage, I think he really liked um, uh, him as a model, mm -hmm. because he, he appears in numerous uh, pictures. But mm -hmm. this is, uh, I think, is absolutely uh, wonderful because it's, uh, you know, it's one of those interior scenes that Sargent handles with such sort of deftness. So, though, it, as always, you don't, you never. Sargent loves to disorient you. Yes. You don't really know where you are, where we are mm -hmm. in space at right. all, or where they are. We had uh, a very long discussion in conservation as to whose legs those are. Yeah, yeah what's happening and down at the bottom? But it's we disagreed. By the way, we never decided whether you they. You couldn't. No. Uh, you couldn't. Uh, you couldn't no, figure it, was, it out. The but jury was out. There they are, lying back on the hay, and uh, in this. Uh, interior and of just the light just coming in, isn't mm -hmm. it? And just catching. I mean, I always think Sargent's really a master. We talk about being a master of light, but he's really a master of shadow. Yes. Uh, and mm -hmm. there's far more shadows in his picture than there are lights, mm -hmm. uh, which is why, of course, when the lights do come on, they're so vivid and... Absolutely. And you said that you recently learned that he met Raffaele earlier than you had expected. Yeah, oh, yes, the letters, these letters to mm -hmm. this... Um, friend, this uh, friend of Raphael's, it's quite clear that they met at Porto in 1903, you know. Mm -hmm. The sources, too, for this are very fragmentary. I mean, there are a few sergeant letters, there are reminiscences by various people, there are a few third-party letters. Um, so, and sometimes there's quite a lot of correspondence. Jane de Glenn, all her letters, but then she stops, or the, she, may not have stopped writing to her sisters, but the Archives of American Arts don't have any letters after about 1907, so you get a very full, and she's a very vivid r letter writer. And there's a wonderful woman who may appear later, Eliza Wood Wedgwood, who was always traveling. With, she wasn't an artist, but she was a faithful companion, mm -hmm. and always sat, she was, she was always there sitting beside Emily, just sitting there, being a sort of comforting presence, but um, she left a wonderful um, uh, diary and, mm -hmm. and reminiscence of her time with the sergeant. So there are some, but it's a bit scattered. Mm -hmm. You know, one yearns sometimes for a bit more on some of the some of the uh, the years. You've got really uh, all too little. Um, and there were relatively few letters in his possession when he oh, died. We, yeah, I mean, maddening, he kept nothing. <laughs> so there are masses of his letters hither and thither. He was so fed up with having to answer. And so he, he hated all this correspondence. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it's too bad. the first thing he did was to bin them all, I'm sure. Um, uh, so, anyway. Very um, frustrating. What? Very frustrating. Yeah, very frustrating. And, of course, no, no records of his work, uh, no diaries, no nothing of that kind. So let's talk a little bit about your retracing of Sargent's travels. And I think the Alps are very fascinating in terms of um, where he went, where he first worked, and then where he continued to work uh, in the Samplon. And we have a few pictures here. One is the hotel in Pertu, yeah. uh, which was the, the first location of choice yeah. Um, from 1904 to 8, I think, is that yeah. around that? Yes. And um, you've visited, the hotel is still there? It's still there, yes. Well, when I first went there, there was a huge building, um, and I th there, the, the, the hotel, and I thought, oh goodness, they've knocked down. But no, the gable, when I really looked more closely, they'd simply expanded the hotel, and the central section mm -hmm. was absolutely uh, there intact. So it mm -hmm. is still the hotel where Mr. Sargent uh, stayed is still, is still there. And do you have any sense of why he first gravitated to this particular spot? I mm -hmm. don't I think probably somebody had said to him, mm -hmm. I think, but I don't really know mm -hmm. otherwise why he would have, because Portu is quite off the map. Mm -hmm. It's near Cormailleur but it's sort of up this valley, and it's not somewhere that, it wasn't like somewhere it's a, route, a, a sort yeah. of um, fashionable um, place. Yeah, and I included this other photo because these were very, very active people. They, yes. they were out hiking and... Yeah, this, this, all these images in the exhibition of these beautiful girls sort of uh, lounging back or lying down in these oriental clothes or in those great things couldn't be further from the truth. There they all are in hobnail boots out on the mountains. Mr. Sargent is inventing. So this is really what life mm -hmm. was like in uh, the Portu or the Samplon. On vacation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and I did, um, I first went to the Samplon uh, and it was, I'm sure, my father took us there. In 1947, we went to mm. Switzerland um, and uh, through a war-torn France, mm -hmm. it was really dire. And ca came to Switzerland, and England was in austerity. We all had ration books. And suddenly there in Switzerland, you could have everything. You know, it was like a land flowing with milk and honey. But my father took us up for four days to the Samplon, where he had spent so many as a boy. And I think that was a, my first sort of... Um, uh, pursuit of Sargent, if you like, and we walked up to the Kaltwasser Glacier over all the streams that he had painted, um, and uh, so it was a very memorable, mm -hmm. uh, I've never forgotten it. Mm -hmm. um. So, if we continue, uh, the Carrara pictures are one of the great feature of Boston's holdings, and he went in 1911, um, well before this was a touristic stop. And he really weathered the conditions there, amazingly, in order to paint. Well, he lived in a hut in extremely primitive conditions. Um, but he, was all, he were, didn't mind roughing. I mean, when he was out in Palestine, you know, with the Bedouin, he was obviously camping and on horseback. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, he didn't, uh, sort of physical uh, rigors didn't, or in the Rockies, I, I had to track him into... Twin Falls, and, and um, uh, gosh, that was a, an epic of a walk. And then um, uh, Lake O'Hara. And so he, if physical, and he, there again he was camping out. Uh, mm -hmm. um, he was uh, a sort of uh, quite intrepid on mm -hmm. um, uh, all that. But I, Carrara, I have been to Carrara, but of course I, what I love to do, you see, really, is to be absolutely... and. Terry's done it as well, you know, to be in the spot where Mr. Sargent was and really identify, you know, where, where, where you are. And I, uh, of course, sometimes I've skipped over walls where I shouldn't be, and, you know. <laughs> and um, Cha Cha in Venice took us to, uh, who was our Venetian waterman, we spent a week identifying Sargent's um, Venice watercolors. And uh, Ms. Cha Cha 
wonderful. Um, used to take us into places you weren't supposed to go at all, you know, in pursuit of. And um, uh, so we've we've had a few adventures, um, one way or another. And uh, was but and the Carrara, yeah. unfortunately, you can't because they the They've quarry changed, as they've yeah. been quarrying for the last hundred years. So the, the quarries don't look uh, the same, but they are marvelous, abstract, um, and right in your. Uh, that's really Sergeant not letting you. No relief. He pushes your nose up against these great blocks and and these ant-like figures. Mm -hmm. And uh, I should say these are Sargent's photographs that we're looking yes, at. Yes, well, yeah. yes, I think these were, we're never always quite sure because he was also with his manservant, Nicola, uh, who also took photographs and Wilfred de Glenn took um, photographs, but a few of them survived mm -hmm. through the de Glenn connection. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, um, here, here is, um, a typical one with them uh, shaping the blocks of, of marble. Uh, and there are others, some amazing ones. And uh, because these, um, these great blocks had to come down the mountain uh, and it was a very hazardous uh, mm -hmm. profession, these lizardory, lizard the, yes. the yeah. quarry workers. And then when you got them to the bottom, you then had to shape them and all the rest of it. And you had to let them down with these huge ropes. And of course, if you, you let two set pairs of ropes and if you let go, you know, you in dead trouble with what a uh, sort of, you know, mm -hmm. Your 100 friends. ton yeah. <laughs> block of marble yeah. coming down. And by way of a slight advertisement for a lecture I'll be giving on May 4th, if you can all come back and join us, um, I had the opportunity to trace through some of the Italian villa gardens with my sister who's here tonight. And it was remarkable, not only to see what Sargent did paint, but what he didn't paint. And this is uh, a set of views of the gardens at the Villa Reale di Marlia outside of Lucca. These grand axial uh, designs, um, including the pathway leading to the largest pool garden in Italy and the beautiful uh, assemblage of sculptures and the exedra behind it, all lined with lemon trees. And then one sees what Sargent chose to paint, and that's the spot from which he painted it. Um, and he chooses to create this brilliant watercolor of the uh, backside, for better word, uh, lack of a better word, of these two river gods that are at the end of the pool garden. And I think it's just so enlightening to do what you've done in terms of tracing pathways and encountering the places Sargent experienced to really understand what he chose to paint. I, I always wonder whether I'm the ghost of looking at Mr. Sargent, or Mr. Sargent is the ghost, and I'm the, the you know, because you, you feel your eavesdropping mm -hmm. on where he was. Um, so it's sometimes rather eerie, um, that, that uh, e yeah. experience. But it is very um, special when you suddenly identify something, uh, you know, you come on something you've been searching for. And then I remember going down in the Val d'Aosta, um, and there's a famous picture of, uh, of the sort of Mont Blanc Massif, and there was a particular sort of glacier, and I couldn't see it, and then suddenly the clouds parted at a certain point, and I was just at the right angle, because very often, if you're not at the right angle, you can miss things, and there was the, pi the picture, and you just felt, I, you know, I've, I've got it. Um, but what he's, I think, also very interesting is, I mean, Sargent's a master of the fragment, you know. I mean, you look at Santa Maria della Salute, which is several pictures there, which is one of the great churches at the beginning of the Grand Canal, and um, uh, famous Turner and Monet and all, uh, all the great painters have painted, but does Mr. Sargent paint the dome and this great church? No, he hones in on this just this front entrance and the side chapel. It doesn't show you the dome or anything. And this is absolutely typical of him. And if you go around Venice, of course he painted from a gondola. Uh, everything is from the gondola. And it's like a series of angles and odd perspectives. Um, and I remember in Sicily um, at Agrigento, um, he painted uh, some wonderful 
paintings of this rolling landscape going down to the sea. And I suddenly sort of realized that if he'd moved his easel about two inches, he would have got in the famous Greek temples at Agrigento. But I think it was absolutely deliberate because he wasn't interested in that. He, it was the flow of the landscape and this would have been a distraction. You know, it would, he was not a painting views like Santa Maria de Salute. He's not painting um, uh, uh, things as sort of icons. His, his particular things fascinate him. And look at that great, um, wonderful great fountain, you know, the Hercules in mm -hmm. the gardens of the Villa Medici, the Hercules is chopped off. He doesn't, you know, the main point of this thing is the statue of Hercules at the top. It's just cropped out. Um, uh, and uh, it wasn't what interested him, it was the bowl, the two great bowls and the interlinking um, part of the pedestal between with all those wonderful, um, and of course sergeants always you, you think there's an awful lot there. You know, we were looking mm -hmm. at Santa Maria della Salute and you think that you know, he's really just really got the figures and all right. of it. When you come up close, it's just a flick of paint. I mean, it's so, uh, it's a sort of illusion that how he, there's much less and it's, that's all part of the abbreviation and the abstraction and the modernism mm -hmm. because I think they are intensely modern in their, the way that he, he flattens the space, it's all about the paint, it's about the material of paint, how you handle paint. And when you get up, sometimes things to seem to transpose, the substances become mm -hmm. quite else. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's almost as if it's the sub substance of paint, quite as much as representation per se. And that's what I think also is so, so modern about him. Um, and you feel his energy, yeah. you know, still, don't they? they you, these are scenes that, Absolutely, the, he's caught the moment, and they're so um, charged with his nervous energy. I mean, he's a difficult person to ever get in under the skin of because he's such a private, reserved person. Um, but when it comes to his art, you feel the mm -hmm. energy and the passion yeah. and the all those emotions that he never displayed in yeah. life. Um, and his presence, uh, really. Uh, uh, yeah. All there, mm -hmm. you know, and people used to say, you know, the descriptions of him are of him at sort of white heat. And it's the same with his, when he's painting portraits, demons, demons, he used to say as he rushed back and forth. And you can see in these pictures that I think he sort of, um, he knew what he wanted to do he, in his mind. Once he got in his mind, then he sets about it. And there's a wonderful essay in the catalogue, which by the two um, uh, uh, conservatives, conservatives. Uh, about the amazing range um, of um, uh, techniques he's using. And he's using whatever is to hand. He's sponging out, he's using the back of the brush, he's putting on um, uh, impasto, he's, uh, uh, I mean, the, the number, of, and, and nothing is quite what it seems. And even some of the conservators don't really know sometimes what, mm -hmm. what mediums he's using. Mm -hmm. but. It's all, all it, whatever he got, he got it in his head, and it's painted, you know, al primo, absolutely. Um, and he's so confident, but he, was it, there's a wonderful description of him saying, you know, each watercolor is an emergency, you know. Uh, you, you, you feel there's no comfort zone for him. He, he's, each time he's chancing his arm, and the more complex the light effects, the more complex the surfaces, the more, the more he seems to relish it. There's no formula, yeah. mm -hmm. which is why it's all so alive. And well, and to see so many and to have so many of them be different and distinctive. Yeah. And well, because he can do it, can't he? Sometimes those very beautiful architectural studies, mm -hmm. so clear and mm -hmm. lucid and beautifully done, and then you get something like the gourds or the, you know, the, which is uh, the, just or a the fury, mountains, yeah. with just a whole lot of mm -hmm. rocks thrown down, and you'd think it's the most unprepossessing subject, but mm -hmm. you know, he does do, he yeah. brings it to life, and yeah, um, yeah, there's a tremendous range of subject matter and, and techniques, um, and he's doing whatever he feels is right for that. For the subject. For the moment, yeah. yeah. And it's all about arresting, and that's what I think, some of them you feel like, um, 
the salute where he did about a dozen pictures in oil of watercolor, you feel they're like a series of meditations of a series of, of this thing seen under different conditions. Sometimes he's close up, sometimes he's further away. And you know, working through a sort of succession mm -hmm. of um, treatments of the same motif. I think that's also a very modern sort of approach. So Richard, can we take a few questions? Is that, oh, yes. would you be open to that? Of course. Great. Yes. So does anyone have a question? Right here, if you could stand up and- You'll have to- I will. Mm -hmm. okay. My voice stands up. Okay, very good. Uh, was money a problem for Sargent? Money. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Money always, uh, of course, does matter. But he made a lot of money as a portrait painter and as a mural painter. But it is true that um, uh, he gives up portrait painting in 1907, except for a few exceptions. And um, it's clear that after 1907, he is marketing his oil paintings. He's each year, and increasingly from about 1910 onwards, a series of pictures go to Nerdler, and Nerdler handle them, and they go to American collectors, by and large. And I think that's because of the loss of, um, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, of the portrait income. He needs to supplement it. And he's got his responsibilities for his sister. Um, and um, so I think that, you know, but he was, um, he, he, I, mean, I don't think he always knew because he had very good advisors, in, particularly in America, um, uh, so that, uh, he, I don't think he, he probably worried sometimes more than he needed to, um, but he was certainly, ve you know, very well off, um, mm -hmm. uh, relatively speaking. But I think that, that, that um, uh, and the fact that he, uh, I mean, the watercolors he sold to Brooklyn, I mean, he was selling them for sort of um, $200 a piece or whatever it was, mm -hmm. 250. 241. 50, sort of 50. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Um, so, um, uh, so that did, uh, uh, money did matter to yes. him, and he well, took on more mural commissions too. And he worked incredibly hard as a portraitist, and I think that's part of what exhausted his yeah. um, connection to that work. And I think the thing is that, you know, the great thing about going to the Alps and all of that, he didn't have patrons, and worse still, their relatives leaning over his shoulder, you know, tutting or telling him what they wanted. Mm -hmm. Someone else? Yes, right here. Sergeant's academic training. Uh, well, yes, he did. Uh, he studied with Carolus Durin, a, a French portrait painter. Uh, in fact, if you go to um, the Met, to that exhibition, Impressionism and Fashion, you'll see Carolus Durin's absolutely terrific portrait of the, fa the woman with the glove, La Femme au Gant. Uh, which is a sensational black portrait. But uh, the thing about Carolus Durin, where Sargent really learned his trade in a way that some, somebody like Whistler, you feel is much more struggles with great artists as he is, struggles with the medium, that Carolus Durin taught his pupils from the very beginning, instead of just doing that thing, you know, you must draw from the cast and then you can draw from life and only after you've been through all that discipline are you actually allowed a paintbrush, Carlos Durin taught his people right from the start to paint and to paint values, that was the great word, the difference of lights and darks and that each stroke of the brush must define a, a value. And it was that technical um, expertise that Carlos Durin passed on. But Sargent also studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts uh, at the rigorous drawing uh, regime. So he jolly well knew his drawing, and in a sense, the, the murals, which are very um, ambitious compositions, very academic, go right back to that training in the Ecole.
but Carolus Giorna was the one who really gave him that skill with the brush, which of course in the oil painting and also in watercolor, because sometimes you feel he's painting watercolors almost as an oil painter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same, isn't it? Sort mm -hmm. of instinctive. Yeah, in a couple of the pairs up yeah. in the galleries, you can you can see that. One or two, right here. I wish I knew the answer, because you sometimes feel, why did he pick up the oil paint that day, uh, or rather than the watercolor? I think he always, I think, uh, and particularly later when he was selling things through Nerdler, he knew he'd got to come back with some pictures that were saleable, I mean, that were, were good enough, in his view, to, um, to, to sell an exhibit. Uh, and so I think, but, um, of course, with watercolor, you've much greater freedom. You can, uh, I mean, an oil painting is a much more of a commitment. So I think he probably, I don't know, I sort of feel he may have rationed himself a bit, uh, you know, that I can't just paint watercolors because I've got to, you know, produce um, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a summer corpus of, I've got to come back with some mm -hmm. oil paintings. So mm -hmm. I think there must have been some in his mind, and of course the oil paintings, some of them may have been finished in the studio, we don't know, rather like Raffaele, you see him there, he's painting actually in the studio from all sorts of oil sketches. Mm -hmm. But why he preference one over another, it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. And Woman in White? Maybe just a brief comment about Sargent's Orientalism. Orientalism. Yes. Um, well, I think it's sort of make-believe because um, it, it, you're not under any illusion that they're Oriental models. They're clearly European models, and that's in an Alpine setting by Alpine Brooks. So he's, <laughs> but he he did love fantasy. I mean, his one favorite book was The Arabian Nights, The One Hundred and One Nights. I mean, that was the absolute. And um, uh, who's the um, uh, Vartek, um, uh, Beckford, William Beckford, famous late 18th century mm -hmm. uh, oriental mm -hmm. fantasy. And he loved Flaubert's Salambo. So he loved, there is that fantasy element, mm -hmm. which I think is deeply attractive to Sargent. But I don't think he's not really like true orientalist painters who paint harems and sheikhs and like slave Delacroix, markets right. and all mm -hmm. that stuff. I right. mean, this, he's playing with it. Costume. And, but he loves to wrap these models, these mm -hmm. sensuous models, in, uh, in these extraordinary uh, cashmere shawls that he wraps round them and round them. Mm -hmm. And it's as much about the shawl as, uh, and again, flattening the space. And, you Absolutely. Know, uh, yes, they're delicious um, mm -hmm. pictures. And, <laughs> and of course, they're deliciously painted, and mm -hmm. the colors are so gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, they're just, and you get up, the impasto is so, you know, wonderful, isn't it, when Sargent's really going. Um. One more, I think, right here. Mm -hmm. Madam X. Um, Um, do you just want to say a word about Sargent's feelings about the Madame X portrait? Oh, I think he knew it was his one of his great pictures. Uh, um, and um, uh, as soon as Madame Gautreaux had died, um, Edward Robinson, who was the director at the Met, put in a bid for it. And I think Sargent, that really appealed to him that it would come to the Metropolitan Museum. And, and I think he knew it was one of his... And he put an enormous amount of effort into it. I mean, he it was painted at his request, this extraordinary woman um, with her white skin and that sort of incredible profile. Um, and I think he spent more time on it. And, and it was, you know, a very considered masterpiece, which is why it was such a shock to him 
you know, when it was lambasted at the, uh, and, it, and in looking at it today, why, how could people have, have I mean, it's a sort of icon of high style, and she's, but uh, uh, it somehow got under everyone's, ne you know, it, uh, and it was mocked as being a sort of decadent, decadent thing, and, uh, um, and the fact that she's sort of so not a kind of um, a conventional role model for women, is it? She's sexy and she couldn't give a damn. I mean, she's that bravado and provocativeness and, of course, off the shoulder and all of that. Um, and uh, it really did, um, uh, because he'd planned it as being his real knockout blow at the salon. This was really going to put him in the big time. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was, you know, and that's then he comes really to England with his tail between his legs. And it's a, he talks of giving up art after Madame Gautreaux. I mean, he's so depressed. Um, so uh, uh, it was a real disaster for him. But of course, it's one of the great pictures. It's fantastic. Um. So I want to urge all of you to pick up the palm card outside. We have a wonderful Sargent course that will include lectures by Erica Hirschler, Trevor Fairbrother, our conservator, Tony Owen, um, and myself. And with that, I want to thank you, Richard, for sharing so much. Thank you.